Okay, so welcome to our class, Comparative Literature. And today we will be again discussing the historical background of British Irish. And in our previous class, we have learned the scenario that is how many countries are included in the UK and how many islands are also included in the UK. Today, we will um, also try to understand the political history of Britain and also uh, the linguistic history. As we have learned that UK is a combination of four countries and also some other islands. Uh, there were uh, several political uh, revolution and struggle among the countries from within and from outside. However, such kind of political struggle leads to another history regarding the linguistic history of the uh, country. So we will try to get a picture of the linguistic history as well as the uh, political history of Britain or UK. And uh, any attempt at comparing the literature of the British Isles must have an historical dimension that we have understood in our previous class. The linguistic and cultural diversities within the British Isles need to be set in context. And it is not enough to work with the boundaries that can be drawn at the present time be the linguistic, geographical, or political. So when we will be thinking about the scenario or context of comparative literature in Britain, we have to take several things in our mind. Uh, that means what, in which perspectives we will be comparing the literature of Britain. Is it the linguistics boundary? Is it the political boundary? Is it the cultural boundary? Already, we have several approaches of comparative literature. Uh, some say the formalist approach, some say the neocritic approach or the positivism, uh, uh, sorry, the formalist approach or structuralist approach. So of course, we should take the consideration of the history, both the political history and the geographical history and the linguistic history of United Kingdom in order to get the idea of comparative literature in uh, British Isles. Uh, the present political division uh, dates from the foundation of the Irish Free State in 1922, which became the Republic of Ireland in 1937. Uh, the Irish came into being in uh, Irish state. They, they came into existence in 1916 and as the Irish Republic. And in 1922, having succeeded from the United Kingdom under the Anglo-Irish Treaty, it became the Irish Free State and it comprises 26 of the islands of Ireland's 32 counties. So this is the history of the free state Ireland. That's of course the political history. And in 1937, the constitution remained the free Isle, the state Ireland and in or on 29th December 19, 1937, the new constitution of Ireland came into effect, remaining the Irish free state to simply IR or in the language of Ireland. So uh, they became independent in 1937, they became the Republic of Ireland in 37. And this is the history of 
Ireland. Apart from the history of um, Ireland, if we go to the Scotland, uh, Elizabeth the first was the was childless, and for this reason, their James Stuart became the uh, king of UK and joined in uh, England. James the first. He was also born. He was born in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, okay, in Scotland. And from that time, he was the uh, king of Scotland as James IV. And uh, in uh, he became the king of England also in uh, 1603. And he was the king of all whole UK. That means king of Great Britain from 1603 to 16 uh, to five. And Jim was a strong advocate of royal absolutism and his conflict with the increasing self-assertive parliament set the uh, stage of the rebellion against the successor, uh, Charles the first. So we know the history of anglo section anglo nerman period and here uh, in terms of pinpointing the history of uk we have started here that is the scotland joined in uh, yeah, england and the king of scotland became the king of england or the uk great britain in 1603 and he was the king up to 1625 and another thing is that uh, actually any hopes of the Stuart restoration in date when Hanno variants crossed the second Jacobite rising in 1745 what it is that is the Hanover is a royal house of uh, Royal House of Hanover, whose members are known as Hanoverians. It's a German royal house, and that ruled Hanover, Great Britain, Ireland as various times during the 17th to 20th century. So the Hanovers. The Hanover, they were trying to get control of UK. And for this reason, the Stuart's kingship was not um, continued. This is the history of um, Scotland. Then Wales had been incorporated in the 13th century. And although a guerrilla war was fought for several centuries and the accession of the Tudor signals the absorption of uh, Wales into what would eventually become the United Kingdom in 1536. So again, uh, in uh, Wales also included in with the UK and um, UK became United Kingdom in uh, 1536. It is in short, the history of United Kingdom. And, uh, but the linguistics history is different. The political map doesn't con correspond with a linguistic map nor to the pattern of widely different literary tradition. The 19th century, the age of nationalist movement across Europe had a repercussion uh, in the British context as well, with a revival of interest in Celtic language in general. So the Scottish language and the other, in previous class, we had been talking that actually the Celtic is their old language. Celt, the people of uh, Celtic. And this is their um, old uh, language, linguistics heritage. The last native Cornish speaker, for example, died in the 18th century, but Cornish was being revived as a literary language by the end of the 19th century. Uh, so Cornish language. And 
uh, work was continued on the construction of this dead Celtic language to the present day, despite the fact that Cornwall is technically a region of England and has no autonomy or, or what, uh, whatsoever. So uh, when uh, we have also learned that actually the competitive literature started in Europe with the concept of linguistics identity and nationalistic identity. When such kind of scenario we see all over the Europe, what happened to England? It happened that in UK, the origin, the Celtic language people were coming to uh, coming forward. And every people, though they are using language, but they are trying to get link with their traditional language that is the Celtic language. Uh, the Isles of Man, on the other hand, has never been absorbed administratively into the United Kingdom. Already we have known that they were separate part and is self-governed to a large degree and being unrepresented in the House of Commons. Its language, Mansk, died out of a spoken tongue in 1950 and 1960 decade, which means that there are still extend depths of native speakers as well as a body of written text. So Celtic language, we have learned that already in the last half of the 18th century, the people had not been using the Celtic language, but when the nationalistic movement arise in the whole Europe, then the Celtic language started to came uh, as a life language. Everybody wanted to have a link to their a linguistic past that is Celtic language. And the Isles of Men, they have also another language that is the Manx. They were trying to come forward as a linguistics national identity. And this is also uh, the history of the Jacobite rising in uh, uh, 1745. We have um, also talked about that. And uh, there are House of Tudor, Royal House, uh, English Royal House of Wales origin, descended from the Tudors of the uh, Penimit. So this is, and the formation of the United Kingdom that has already, we have got the information that uh, 1536, the UK was in, uh, uh, formed. And, uh, uh, on, and on previous time, that means we see that England uh, had been dominated and ruled by many uh, kings from France, from uh, Scotland, or from other part. And also, we know the history of Normandy, the Duke of Normandy occupied and defeated the last king of England, that is the uh, Harold. Harold was killed by the William the Conqueror the second, and William the Conqueror became the king of England in uh, 1066. So this is the historical past. But we are discussing the part when competitive literature started in uh, the Europe. And this is also uh, 16th century English politician and ambassador, lyric poet created, uh, uh, Sir Thomas uh, Watt. Okay, we will be discussing about this uh, uh, tradition. Both Cornish and uh, Mans are Celtic language, but have virtually disappeared. In contrast, Irish, Welsh, and Scott Galley have been undergoing a living revival for reasons that have everything to do with a reassertion of ling national identity through the medium of language. So when invited to contribute to an anthology of contemporary Scottish poetry, Sole Mac, uh, MacLean, the great Scott Gaelic poet of the 20th century, chose his poem, The National Museum of Ireland. We know that uh, Mans and uh, Cornish, they are the old form of Celtic language, part of Celtic language. They were died, but Irish, Wales and Scots Gaelic, they were living language, especially the people had been using, still using the, uh, using this language. But that language, that means Cornish and ma uh, Mans came forward uh, as the linguistic identity. And in this regard, MacLean, uh, he uh, 
choose a poem. Actually, he is a Scottish poet, Gaelic language poet in the 20th century. When uh, there was an offer to give a, a poem to the National Anthology, he chose his poem, The National Museum of Ireland. Look here. Uh, Sole Maclean is from Scotland. However, he chose a poem that titled The National Muse Museum of Ireland. And uh, here, because it too has so much history in it, in this poem, he said that the Museum of Ireland, so much history um, is included in this uh, museum. So much of the tragic history of Scotland and of the world as well as of Ireland, a gale. If he is at a gale, must love Ireland as well as Scotland. So we see uh, such kind of attitude. There is no space here even to attempt a proper dis discussion of the revival of Celtic. Uh, no space have even to attempt a proper dis discussion of the revival of Celtic language over the past century. So the origin Sorry for the interruption. So this was the situation that uh, whenever uh, in all over the Europe that linguistics identity was coming into context. So it was not an exception in terms of uh, UK and Britain. It is uh, of course far too simplistic to suggest the national identity is necessary to necessarily linked to the surviving practice of text creation in the Celtic language and the number of power, powerful writers in Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England all testify to the way in which English the hegemonic language and can be used in diverse ways but it is important to note that the need for continuity with the past with the past that emerges in the work of anglophone british writers equally with celtic ones and michael o uh, langlin a product of the 20th century mush media world rejects and then immediately reasses his relationship to the mythical hero irish hero uh, Kuchu Lane. So all were in different way. They are trying to connect with their traditional past. Here, the uh, mentioned of a mythological Irish hero, and his name is uh, Kuchu Lane. I, if I lived in the palace for a thousand years, I could never construct you. So it is for the uh, mythical hero of Ireland. They had been talking, and also here. Uh, then in an is an English speaking Irish writer looking back at his Celtic mythic inheritance. So all Irish writer, he himself is speaking English. However, he is trying to get his link towards his mythical link with a mythical hero, uh, Kuchu uh, Lane. Yeah. And in the same way, uh, a Teutonic mythology of the Anglo-Saxon world. John Montague and Northern Irish poet sums up this sense of being uh, tough with an ancestral past in the last lines of this poem, like Dolmen Sound, My Childhood, O oh, Old People. So again, the old people of Ireland, Scotland, okay? uh, they were trying to get, the, uh, get their linkage with their cultural heritage, especially the linguistic heritage. They are trying to get close to the linguistic heritage, uh, past tradition 
of their own. Though there was a hegemonic uh, power uh, of English language all over the world. And for the hegemonic linguistic power of English, all language, Celtic language, Welsh or Irish language, Gaelic language were suppressed. But the famous writer, they were speaking in English, the dominant language. However, they were trying to get linked towards the uh, past language, the original language or the uh, 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 old language that has been used a uh, thousand years back by the people of their own culture. So this is the um, scenario and the Pelican Guide to English Literature, the trusted Swaltwart used by the student since 1950 and divided into seven separate volumes brings Irish and Scottish writer under the writer under the definition of English literature with, without a quell. Okay. So here there is a, a, a assumption that uh, the seven section, all the writer, the Pelican Guide to English Literature, they have included all writers uh, in this banner. Okay. And they said that uh, actually this is not because uh, there is a seven category, all where all category and all different linguistics um, writing were put under one heading that is the Pelican Guide to English Literature. In volume one, the age of torture, uh, John spares chapter a survey of medieval verse state boldly that the most living poetry in the 15th century and early 16th century until we come to what was composed in Scotland. And for it is unlikely that even the Scleton enthusiast would claim that he is equal of the uh, Scott poets uh, 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 Dunbar. So we have learned a little bit about these two poets. This is Dunbar and also what? So it is a politician and also a lyric poet. And it is also um, uh, his family adopted the Lang uh, Lankan strain site in the words of Rogers, but he's credited, this lyric poet was credited with introducing the sonnet to English literature. And also Dunbar also a Scottish marker and a creative artist. He is also a famous poet uh, of Scotland. So Walt and Scotland, they are um, great poet of Scotland and they have been included in this uh, volume and many by many critics, they are equal to uh, Chaucer. And a fact that English literature enjoys a particularly exalted place in the world, partly through the influence of individual writers and more recently through the prominence of English language. Of course, the, uh, the argument is that English literature for uh, gains uh, upper status in comparison to other um, uh, Lingua literature, ju just like Scot Scotland literature, Irish literature, for the cause of the linguistic hegemony and the power. But we can deny the um, existence of other languages in Britain or in UK, uh, United Kingdom. The Norman conquest in uh, 1016 ended the role of Saxon and Danes in uh, uh, England. And the impact to that invasion has tended to obscure the pattern of territorial change that were taking place elsewhere. And the great programs of castle and cathedral building and the spread of monasteries through the former section territories is familiar story. The less familiar, however, are the gradual decline into the anarchy in England and the power of Norwegians in the northern part of British Isles. And just two years before the death of uh, in uh, 1100 of William II, the son of Duke of William, who became the first of the Norman kings of England. We have also talked that Duke of Normandy, he became the first king of England and he came from France, the Duke of Normandy. Normandy is a dukedom of France and these people, Duke of Normandy, 
came over here in England and occupied the power of England. Magnus of Norway had seized the uh, uh, seized the Orkis and the Hebrides of the Isles of Man. So uh, again, uh, during the reign of Stephen, William the Malesbury wrote, England is become the dwelling place of the foreigners and the poetry of strangers, a property of strangers. At the present time, there is no Englishman who is either Arl, Bishop and, or Abbot. Actually, the many people came or, uh, many, from many parts of the world because before Anglo-Normal, the Danes, Jutes, sections, they were not from England. They came from the other European part, Danish parts, and, uh, Norwegian parts, and they occupied the power of England. And after them, uh, Normandy, Duke of Normandy came and occupied the power of England. And with such a scenario, this William Mackelsey, uh, Mackels, uh, Ma Mel Meshbury said that actually England is, has become the uh, place for the strangers. They are getting property uh, from us. And now the Englishmen, that means whose language are Celtic, who were originated from the um, uh, old British tradition, actually you will not see a British person in, in, in power and position. This is the uh, uh, situation claimed by William Malmeshbury. Where invention, invasion, appropriation of land, and the destruction of the old order, radical changes to language. So uh, when um, uh, Norman language, Duke of Normandy, he became the king of England. Actually, the Duke of Normandy, he ruled um, England nearly, um, nearly 1660 to 1100, nearly 40 or 30 years. But within this time, this man didn't speak English. This man spoke uh, French language. Okay, and also um, uh, the Duke of Normandy appointed many of his friends' friend in the position and rank of UK and England. And at that time, the original language and the Celtic language was suppressed. Okay. So, so when the political upheaval, um, when the political chaos was were creating within the country, that political chaos create influence to the linguistic heritage of the country. And that was not an exception in uh, UK. And as we see uh, from the history. And um, uh, another thing is that um, during the so-called dark ages, scholar and members of the nobility flocked to Ireland to the take advantages of the Irish school and the venerable bad notes. Actually, when such kind of situation created uh, the OIR uh, revolution, especially the people, uh, uh, the area of England, uh, this is very uh, a consular atmosphere to live. So people from all Europe, especially the Norwegian, Danes, this country are heavily winter prone country. And also the Vikings, they also came over here to occupy England. And when they, occup they would occupy England, naturally the people uh, moved England and uh, would go to Ireland, scholars, lighters, and everything. And for this reason, Irish linguistics and literary tradition becoming rich in such a tumultuous situation in England. European Renaissance was anticipated by several centuries. And uh, during the three, uh, during three centuries, Ireland was the asylum of the higher learning, which took sanctuary there from the uncultured state of Europe. So from the all parts, not only uh, from uh, England, all parts, the people went to Ireland to study there to live there calm and cool. In this way, the Irish literature got a uh, topmost position in, um, in, in, in seven, uh, Ireland in 700 years. Renaissance began in Italy in 15th century, but 
more than 700 years back, Ireland became a part of the all scholars who are not uh, happy to live in the other part of Europe. They went to Irish. And for this reason, we see the Renaissance started in Ireland more than 700 years earlier to Italian Renaissance. And also, uh, there are another tradition uh, that is um, uh, Bardic tradition. They will be uh, writing the song uh, in praise of prince, kings, and queens in Ireland. Uh, in case of Wales, in the mid 20th century, the great book of Leinster was compiled, a vast collection of ancient Irish legend. But the Anglo Norman invasion effectively chalked the cultural life of Ireland. The, uh, the great center of learning decayed, and there began a long, long period of permanent war, which, as Douglas Hyde put it, against uh, almost from its very uh, uh, commencement, truly arrested. Irish development and disintegrated Irish life. Four centuries later, the comparative picture of the literary production changed uh, completely. Through the Renaissance, flowered in continental Europe, it arrived in England was delayed. And for such reason, the revival of learning, that is the Renaissance, came England in delayed. In Scotland, however, the Renaissance came parallel to the developments in the rest of the Europe. The second half of the 15th century is one of the greatest periods of literary research in Scotland. Um, as we see that in Ireland, Renaissance came 700 years earlier to Italian Renaissance. In England, it was delayed. And in Scotland, it was parallel to the time when Renaissance came in Italy. At that same time, Renaissance the revival learning came in Scotland at the same time because for some special literary and political personalities of this uh, area, especially the King James the First, Robert Henderson, William Dunbar, uh, Gavin Douglas, and Sir David Lindsay. And there was also a great deal of translation in Scots and the wealth of poetry produced into the so-called golden age of English literature stand in sharp contrast to the few city of works produced in English at the same time. So many uh, literature had been produced at the time in Scotland. Uh, the author of The Compliant also had linguistics politics on his agenda. I touch it notch so these are in Gaelic language, so we will not understand. Full political union between England and Wales took place in 1936, when Wales law was abolished and the parliament in London became responsible also for the Wales. And the Bar Bardic tradition was in decline and the full political union accelerated its demise. However, uh, Um, Wales, which was once the common heritage of the whole country, the Bible came. It came just in time when the dignified tongue was still alive and when there was Welsh priest sufficiently master of it to be able to use it appropriately. And uh, uh, there was another information that is, uh, in the later part of the 16th century, the Bible was translated into Wales. And for this region, the people of uh, the priest of uh, Wales, they, ha they had been using Bible in, their, uh, in the appropriate way. The beginning of the English colonial expansion from the 17th century onwards through the English revolution and the restoration the large number of texts were translated voraciously into English, and large number of sailing vessels carried selves across the Atlantic settlers to the colonies. So in the, 17th, in the beginning of the 17th century, we see the English people started colonies all over the world. And for this reason, many kind of texts of several 
uh, from several linguistics, uh, yeah, uh, linguistic origin, they were translated in English and such kind of text was carried to the all parts of the world. And uh, settlers to the colonies, the, go uh, the goods back into English ports, guerrilla warfare exacerbated by religious conflict continued with cons considerable savagery in Ireland and in Scotland. By the end of the 18th century, the start of the age of Romanticism, another period of great literary development in England. In the picture across the British Isles had again changed completely. So when the 17th century, the British colonial power started to spread their colony all over the world, large number of texts were translated into English. And in this regard, the Romantic movement came forward in, in this way, English language got prominence rather than uh, the other languages of Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. There is another uh, thing. Importer of Germany of Sconhan in the presence of some Irish officers, one of whom spoke to him in Irish, unable to answer. Kelly stayed silent. The emperor turned quickly on me and said, what, oh Kelly, don't you spoke the language of your own country? I replied, please, your majesty, none but the lawyer orders of the Irish people speak. So uh, in such a, uh, at the time of the war, especially Irish language, the or, um, old language had been used by the lawyer class people. And for this reason, many people were trying to forget their uh, own Celtic language. Why? Because if they speak in Celtic language, the ruling class will uh, kill them or they will be tortured. And for this reason, the people of Celt and the people of Celtic origin, they didn't try to uh, uh, learn or speak uh, Celtic language. They know, but they don't try to speak Celtic language. They try to speak other language, English language, the uh, uh, language of the ruling class because of afraid and, and for this reason, some lawyer class people had been using Celtic at this time. Uh, here, uh, French liberation, their significance in uh, is, but by the end of the 18th century, the cultural interface between Dublin, Edinburgh, and London had gone beyond any sense of binary opposition between Celtic and Teutonic linguistic system. While the peasantry stopped in the Gaelic speaking rural um, uh, hinterland, and it became possible to discern a new Anglo Irish in intelligentsia in Scotland. So, this is the linguistics and historical uh, background of um, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Okay. Um, we can deduce the quick scheming across the centuries. Firstly, the predominance of English and of English literature is a relatively recent phenomena, coincides with the rise of the mercantile classes in the late 17th and 18th century with increased colonial expansion of horses. Secondly, that English expansion into the Celtic cultures of the English Isles has been characterized by the conscious strategy of linguistic discrimination that sought to suppress those languages and, uh, and that were seen as cultural signifier of resistance and hostility to English role. Thirdly, that it is hardly surprising given such circumstances that the revival of nationalism, which sweep Europe in the 19th century, fueled by the twin successes of American Revolution and then the French Revolution, should have had its impact on Wales, Scotland, Irish writers, and intellectual. So the scenario is that English language became the language of England. And for this reason, it has become the uh, uh, language of the all colonies uh, by uh, dominated by England. And secondly, uh, when English language is spread all over the world, uh, it is uh, the other Celtic and Welsh language were suppressed. 
but this suppressed language came into discussion for the cause of American Revolution in uh, in the second half of 18th century and also the French Revolution. For these two revolution, the people of UK, Scotland, the people of Ireland, the people in Wales, they were trying to get their original language. That means they try to use their Celtic language. They uh, want to use the man's language. They want to use the Gali language. And that is the linguistic consciousness um, arise in, uh, in, in England. So if we uh, consider the competitive literature in Britain, we have to take the granted the history of um, Britain and the political history is different from linguistic history. However, political history sometimes will make a language uh, dominant and sometimes will make, uh, sometimes will suppress other language. And that is the scenario we see in uh, Britain. So, uh, uh, we will not the failure of comparative literature scholar within the British Isles to consider comparatively the development of different literary tradition within their proper historical context. Actually, uh, when we see the comparative literature is um, in Britain or the UK, naturally the traditional, the old linguistics and the linguistics variety of Britain hasn't been treated as in comparative literature and for this reason the comparative literature in britain is is not uh, successful a great deal of rethinking has been going on the celtic diaspora and for this reason nowadays a tradition has been uh, created that is the celtic diaspora the study of the rise of scottish studies irish studies as international discipline through the 1980 decades testifying to the process and the relationship of the celtic diaspora to the english mainstream still remains to be properly investigated and sean research puts it the relationship of england and ireland colonizer and colonized within a small western european archipelago has to be rethought and reread and art and culture on all dimension of the level of complexity must seek to provide the single word spark to an inextinguishable thought. So such kind, so diaspora, um, Celtic studies, Scottish studies, Irish studies has become revived in 1980 decades with the concept of um, getting linkages with uh, heritage, linguistic heritage or cultural heritage. And uh, another um, uh, notion comes with the idea delivered by uh, Karvanak. Patrick Karvanak, the great Irish poet, discusses the use writers make of national myths and the gap between ordinary life experience and the context of the myth of a nation. Is sins the voice of Ireland? He asked. Has Ireland a voice? He actually, Karvanak puts this term parochial and provincial. Provincial is a state and parochial is something more than a state. When a linguistic language will judge by the province, it will have a narrow escape. And when it will be judged through the whole UK, then it will be a great scope. That is the um, uh, idea presented by uh, Kavanagh. Okay. And he said that uh, in Ireland, we are inclined to be provincial, not parochial. He said that since he is a writer of Ireland, it's okay. But does since voice represent the voice of Ireland? He raised the question. And for this reason, he answered in such a way that in Ireland, we are inclined to be provincial, not parochial. That means uh, we people of Ireland, we are trying to refine ourselves within the boundary of Ireland. We have to go beyond the boundary of Ireland. That is the suggestion in case of comparative literature by Patrick Kavanagh. And he said that 
parochialism is universal it deals with the fundamentals so he is in support of uh, writing in uh, from a broad perspectives uh, and compa comparison with the broad perspectives so kavana uh, uh, he wanted that since we will be considered as a writer of uh, britain or uk not sin will be compared with the writer of ireland this is his suggestion kavanagh distinction between parochial and provincial is an important one in the context in which he used the term he was reproaching a fellow irish writer for the provincialism actually he said that all all writers of uh, ireland they were trying to confine themselves within the irish province so they should come forward with, with their uh, idea that means they have to go uh, uh, and treat it uh, they have to be treated from the writer of uk uh, both writers however in their very ways different ways are representative of scottish uh, parochialism for both writer about the uh, kavana uh, called the fundamentals in their different way and indeed if we look at the range of poets writing to the british isles at the present time that parochial or provincial distinction would provide a good point of comparison so jeffrey hill for example using the native black country as a starting point and tony harrison northern poet of and translator are two english poets who would stand comparison with the scottish and the irish writers in this term so it may be well uh, may well be that such a comparison would be more fruitful than one based on national distinction so again susan besnet he also pointed that that means actually it is good that a poet should not be just uh, from the nationalistic purpose, perspectives so if a writer is considered from the broader perspectives that will be the universality of comparative literature um, in britain and uh, then we will come to the last portion of this that is the comparative britains so we have got the history of language we have got the history of politics of britain now we can see that what is the scenario of comparative literature uh, um, at present after getting the information of all about this so we began by arguing that literature produced by writers of the british isles could not be compared within an understanding of the problematic of Uh, britishness so we have to under understand the idea of britishness whom we call we can call british and after understanding the idea of britishness we have to compare the literature of britain and that the difficulties of using the term british could not be understood without some sense of the use made of the term at different moments of the past the dominance of english language english as a language as a literature as a political system has resulted a marginalization of the great deal of marvelous writing from elsewhere of the island actually now for the dominant position of english language for the dominant position of english uh, literature we see that the literature of scotland the literature of ireland and the literature of wales such kind of literature were suppressed in britain so powerful has england become that many student learning english see britain as a synonym for england so uh, uh, english has become so powerful that means when we see that we call about england and the britain has become the synonymous word that means uh, it means that except england there is no existence of britain the other part and the significant part of britain uh, has been marginalized and some even see london as synonymous with england and even some people go to england and they see that yes london is what we see in london that is uh, about england the terminology of english literature or english studies is used all embracing 
uh, so that Welsh, Scottish, Northern Irish, and Irish writers are frequently included within a syllabus without any reference to their different point of origin and different literary tradition. As we have uh, told it several times that when some literature or some language will get dominance, other literature will be suppressed. So that we see that in English studies, we see that the great writer of Scotland, the great writer of Nor uh, Northern Irish have, have been included without mentioning that they are the great literature of Scotland and the other parts of the Britain, not from the England. This tendency must surely be contributed in large part to the absence of atom to create a competitive literature in the British Isles. And combined with the difficulties presented by the underlying political agenda, Kavanagh may claim Joyce as a truly parochial Irish writer. But a great many English literature courses have taken Joyce over and placed him alongside with D.H. Lawrence, Virginia Woolf, as an example of the English modernism. Acknowledging the existence of Irish literature would improvise, impoverish a great many English literature degrees. So today, with the benefit of post-colonial theory, as it is developing with the methodological tools provided by gender-based criticism, uh, the cultural studies expert like Richard Johnson or a Marxist critic like Terry Eagleton both acknowledge their date to feminist work in returning the personal to the forefront and abolishing the myth of objectivity in literary scholarship. It is becoming possible to think of comparing the literature of the British Isles without resorting to discriminating or appropriatory tactics. So comparative poetry offers an especially uh, rich field consideration of the different ways of the representing shared experience of the urban rural div divide of the significance of the place, both literally, historically and mythically and of the relationship between the individual and his or her environment would all be well worth exploring on comparative basis. So gender studies, cultural studies, um, uh, Marxist studies, and also uh, political, uh, historical um, basis or link, literary link, mythical link, all thing will be discussed in comparative, in competition in comparative literature. Okay, and that will be the uh, good way of uh, judging comparative literature of Britain. So here, um, which offers Welshman perspectives on the encoding words, uh, we will not read that. Another writer, um, uh, Tolby, Anthony Tolby, one of the British, great British comparatists who looked across the Europe for the object of his comparative work. And he stated that literature has an immediacy that engages the reader with other thing than beauty. Okay. Naturally, a uh, reader will be attracted by beauty. But this great comparative troll boy, he said that actually beauty shouldn't be attracted by the reader. Reader will attract the otherness that what is opposite of this literature, not the beauty of this literature. And it is the variety of this experience on subject like fear and freedom and forgiveness, which may in the end from the basis of comparative studies in conjunction with non-literary materials bearing on the same questions. So Tol, uh, Tolby posits here an approach that could well be applicable as a model for a competitive literature of the British Isles. So here Tolby's suggestion that is taken, that means literature shouldn't be compared not on the basis of beauties of the writing, but 
it should be compared with the uh, uh, otherness. That means the opposite principle, opposite style, and opposite theme that should be taken as a model point of British comparative literature. Another one, uh, Narasim Hay argues that that it is not the language of any reason is precisely its strength and its extraordinary cosmopolitan character. Its Celtic imaginativeness, the Scottish vigour, the section concreteness, con concreteness, uh, sorry, concreteness, the Welsh music and the American brazenness suits the intellectual temper of modern India and the uh, composite culture like ours. English is not a pure language, but a fascinating combination of tongues welded into a fresh unity. So all things will be compared in um, English um, uh, literature, British literature. Uh, other two writer came forward, uh, Clayton Kolep and Susan uh, Nokels discussed the changes that have been taken place in comparative studies over the past two decades. They point out that interest in the study of movement, the literary period, period was went and has genre study, genre study and the history of criticism. They know the rising interest in what they describe at the minor genre such as biography and the intersection between generic categories of Western and Eastern criticism. New areas represented in their book included women's studies, uh, the history of education, semiotics, and theory of reading. They summarize these trends as follows. So these two persons, um, Noak and Nokap, they included some other field in comparative literature. That is women studies, the history of Israel, even, even the semiotics they included and the women uh, and the theory of reading in comparative literature. So one can discern uh, a tendency to move away from the matters that have been considered essential to the understanding of the history of literature as a great and ununified cultural enterprise. So uh, that is, uh, the movements, themes, periods, history of ideas towards the issue of the reins around the frontier, emergent literature relationship to other disciplines, women studies, marginalized form of readings, pre-reading, female reading, lethetic reading, or everything will be included in comparative literature by these two um, writers, Noeb and Shushan Knox. And uh, so they said that the competitive literature will be included with a wide, wider change in literary scholarship. Uh, uh, let us conclude this discussion with the uh, Sima Seni again. So um, an open letter was written, as has already been noted, as an occasional uh, piece in uh, recreation uh, reaction against what the poet saw and improper use of the term British and the regard to himself. The poem consists of the 33 stanza and offer a witty argued case. Stanza 10 offers different perspectives on the commonality and the difference of history proposed by the writers. Stanza 7 appears to them. So uh, this was some uh, um, uh, Sima Sini who uh, actually object or who was in the opposite position not to include his poem, poem in a British anthology. So here uh, he, um, um, Susan Bassnett also claimed that we can conclude our um, comparative, literary, uh, comparative literature in Britain by with the uh, Simas Heni. So he, he has mentioned uh, the Heni's poem. Heni's poem is two to force because it presents a deeply personal view of the North, Northern Irish writer's predicament. 
and does it by constructing a comparative case. The tragic history of Ireland combines with the references to the troubled Roman poets. The myth of Mother Island combines with the classical mythology. The uh, images of rape, the imaginary portrait of the Ireland contrast with a depiction of the London literary world. The English perspectives, the exemplified of Do Donald Davy, who is the object of the quite uh, savage concern, is constructed with the brutal, uh, brutal reality of uh, divided families and civil type. The poem concludes with a 20th century uh, fable set in cinema, uh, narrated by dissident Czech writers, Maroslav Holop. So Hini pulls together different threads. His own dis dissidence is set in context compared with the whole of distance, dissidents, and both writers are presented as continuers of the ancient traditional tradition. Actually, this um, uh, Shushan Besnet called that Hini is very much linked to his the old tradition. So here, uh, in the process of reading, at we are invited to follow Hini's thought process backwards in time across cultural boundaries, questioning and challenging assumption, insisting uh, ultimately on the needs of the process of naming to be shared. British, no. He says simply, the name's not right, following the penultimate line with his own signature, yours truly, Simas. So like in his poem, comparative literary study of the British Isles has to begin and end with a rethinking of the process of naming. Okay, so he, he concludes that actually within the um, within uh, the um, idea of uh, Sima Senim, Sushan Besnet also claims that actually in terms of British literature, we have to rethink the process of naming. Naming how we will be uh, calling the literature of uh, United Kingdom. All the poems cannot be called. Uh, British poets or the uh, 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 poems of England. In this respect, SAS and enterprise is closely linked to similar process of naming and renaming that underway in the other post-colonial context, as will be seen in the other chapter. So in, um, in the process of naming, that means we have to identify the uh, multidisciplinary approach of several linguistics and cultural background. So we have got the idea of the history of uh, England, and we have uh, got the idea that this, this England had been uh, dominated by many kings and queens uh, outside England. And for this reason, when a country will be dominated by a foreign king and queens, naturally the linguistic history will be changed. However, in the 17th century, the England is spreaded all over the world as the colonizer. And for this reason, mass number or many number of literature were translated from other language to English language. And English literary field became very much vast. And also for the cause of, uh, uh, also for the cause of a romantic uh, uh, movement in England that also put some emphasis on English literature. And for this reason, in case of the Britain, for the hegemonic or the dominant part of English language and literature, the other parts, that means the Scottish literary background and the uh, Irish literary background, the Welsh literary background, and the Celtic origin language, the man's language were suppressed. So when we will be comparing literature, of Britain, we have to take it granted that we have to go to the other aspects of comparison, that is women's study, gender study, disciplinary study, and other uh, field of comparative literature will be included. And also, we have to think that uh, in order to compare the literature of British Isles, we have to rethink or think about the naming, whether, and we have to get the idea, that means, all literature of Britain are not British literature. And for this reason, 
there is a um, uh, there is an um, uh, proposal or opinion that we have to understand the britishness first and if we understand the britishness then we can compare the literature of british isles in a good way and all the provincial literature will be renamed in their actual name and will be compared with other literature of uh, within britain and within europe and outside europe so thank you very much uh, for uh, attending the class so if you have any question then we will take the questions now this sir, I have a question. I said, "Sir, we have history of 